Is the presidency a strong institution? Well, yes, yes and no. That's not the best answer that you that you want, probably. But but it's it's mixed because it's in a system of of divided government. I mean, divided powers, right. separated powers. Well, I guess the question is then: yeah. When is the presidency strong? Well, the presidency strongest when there's deference, and there tends to be deference when there's a crisis. Okay. And that's when the presidency's strongest. And when the president can exercise discretionary authority. Right. Now, the fact is, though, that the president, even during those times, is still in a uh, modestly weak position. He still needs public support. And even in, even in periods of crisis, and we can just take the period of this last presidency, the George W. Bush presidency, as an example. Think about the Iraq War. Now, the president wanted to get public support for the war in Iraq. And you can think of this as a, a very advantage time because there was no organized opposition. There was uh, great disdain for Saddam Hussein in America, even before he took office. And we had just had the trauma of 9-11, et cetera. So it should be extraordinarily helpful for the president. And yet, the president was not able to move public opinion basically at all in support of the war. Now, he had a majority, but he always had that. In fact, right. they took a poll in, in February of 2001, and there was majority support for attacking Iraq then. Yes. Because of other irritations. Yes. So it act he actually wasn't able to improve on that despite 9-11, despite all the advantages they had, such as the lack of an organized opposition. And um, that, that shows you just how weak a position the president is in. So much of the power of the presidency seems to be invested in rhetoric, in what the president does to attempt to shape arguments and shape opinion and then be prepared to act on it. Do we overstate the role of rhetoric and presidential pronouncement in shaping public opinion? Yeah, I think we do. Um, Many people operate, th they think on an underlying premise, which is that presidents can move public opinion. And they can move it easily if they're just, what, articulate or um, effective on camera. But the fact is, presidents almost never move public opinion. Yep. Uh, we can go to Lincoln. We don't have polls, but we have right. a sense of how he operated. And he, of course, was our most eloquent president. Yes. We can look at FDR, the greatest politician of the 20th century. We can look at Ronald Reagan, the great communicator. Mm -hmm. And all of them had a terribly difficult time in moving public opinion, and rarely did they succeed. And more often, if you had to guess, public opinion moved in the other direction. And that happened to Ronald Reagan on a regular basis. What risk does a president take in acting contrary to public opinion? Well, <clears throat> I suppose it depends first on, on, on the policy. Uh, presidents frequently say that this shows that I'm a, a strong, independent figure, that I'm a man of honor, right? whatever. But uh, if you can't move the public in your direction, the public is ultimately not going to be happy. And presidents typically can't move the public in right. their direction. Now, some matters are more salient than others. So the president may operate uh, contrary to public opinion on right. many issues that the public doesn't really know about or will forget about. They're not salient. Uh, something like war in previous times, certainly civil rights, right. uh, very salient issues, the economy, it's episodic, right. but, but uh, when the economy is bad, it's very salient. And it's, it, the president often is acting contrary to public opinion when he does nothing. So can presidents move issues onto the agenda, or are they better off acting on issues that are already on the agenda? Presidents have some ability to put things on, on the agenda, but there's all, always other things on the agenda as well. Mm -hmm. He's not the only agenda setter. And um, what presidents really need to do, and the essence, the essence of leadership, of presidential leadership, is not in creating opportunities for change. In other words, the classic view of a leader, like the platoon leader that mm -hmm. I was trained to be a long time ago, right. which is follow me. You know, right. here's your objective, now follow me. That rarely works, rarely works. So rather than creating opportunities for change, mm -hmm. for example, going out and mobilizing the public behind you, behind a, a new initiative, is understanding what are the opportunities in my environment. Not overreaching and not underreaching. And then exploiting those opportunities effectively. Now there's lots of ways to do that effectively. 
and sometimes you can exploit uh, public opinion uh, that's existing opinion, but right. it's very difficult for them to change opinion. Similarly, it's very difficult to change the minds of members of Congress. Most of them have long-term commitments and policy views, and the idea that you're going to convert large numbers of members of Congress to the other side, it's just, it's, it's fantasy. But it's, it's really important to know what really is the key to success, to successful leadership, and what is not. Because, for example, if you think that the key to moving Congress, I and mean, that's always an issue for presidents, is get in their face, right. pull strings, you know, then you're going to want to find someone who really seems to be skilled at that. Yeah. But if, if the real key to success is something else, then you're, you're going to look at other kind of, another skill set yeah. in, in a president. So it's quite important. And what we look at as just as citizens, in addition to what we look at as scholars, but just as citizens, yeah. what we're looking for in a president. What are the difficulties that presidents run into when they first come to office in terms of interacting with Congress? I mean, you know, it's been alleged we have a honeymoon, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, then the honeymoon mm -hmm. got shorter and shorter, and then it <laughs> ended before the election. <laughs> when do presidents get in trouble with Congress? Well, each president starts from a different base because they have different members of their party, right. different numbers, members of their party, who are more inclined to support them because they agree. I mean, they're likely mm -hmm. to be in more agreement. So that's that. That's the start. Um, and in current times, we're more polarized. So the differences between the Democrats and Republicans in Congress are greater. It used to be that there would be an overlap, right. and now it's like this rather than overlapping. Yeah. So there's fewer people you can pick off from the other side on, on agreement, you know, who are yeah. inclined to, to, to go your way. But there, there, there are ways to be respectful to Congress and right. not respectful to Congress. There are ways, you know, uh, a doctrine of no surprises is, is generally useful. It just shows respect. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be surprised, even if you don't like the news. Yeah. So there are things like that. Uh, President Carter was criticized for going after small matters, mm -hmm. um, water projects in district, pork barrel. Right. And uh, as, a, as a starter, you know, and, and that, that was... that was perhaps not the best way to establish re a relationship with, with members of Congress. Um, and there were other little things. He charged them for breakfasts at, <laughs> at, at the White House, which probably was silly. Um, but he also uh, had a, uh, an undifferentiated agenda. And one of the, the things that George W. Bush did effectively, because he knew he had limited political capital mm -hmm. given the election in 2000 and, and given the, the completely divided Senate, and a narrow majority in the House, narrow Republican majority mm -hmm. in the House, is that he focused on a few things and, and, and exploited the opportunities that he mm -hmm. had. For example, the tax cut was the first major piece of legislation. And that was a big tax cut. It was a big bill. He knew that he could get that through on a 50% plus one because it couldn't be filibustered. So he, so he, he got that through, and it was strategically important because it, it took money away from other kinds of policies that might mm -hmm. come down the pipe that he didn't want, you know. And uh, on the other hand, he could not get Congress to uh, support much in the way of a faith-based mm -hmm. uh, policy support. And in uh, his other uh, major piece of legislation in that, that first year before, before the, the war on terrorism was uh, the uh, No Child Left Behind Act. And yes. the way he did that is... He, because he knew the Democrats were inclined to be want to support of, of, of things like that, he, uh, he, he dealt quietly with Ted Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And he negotiated with Ted Kennedy. So it was a different way than, than taking your case to the public or, or trying to just ran something through. An, an, uh, so he was very good at adapting to the situation and adapting the policy to the potential. Now, he lost some of that skill, it seems, uh, right. la later on in his, in his tenure. But those are some things that are, that, that are useful to do. But if you try to do everything at once, it means you're likely to get nothing. Yes. And that's a problem. It is, though, a conundrum for presidents in polarized times. Can you do anything else? If the parties are like this or like this, what do you do? What, what can you do? It's really easy to talk about, well, be inclusive or compromise, you know? And sometimes you can compromise on some things, and some things you can't.